I took out the balloon dilation talk um, this year, and partly because most of us are, is it this one? Yeah, play from start. Oh, okay. perfect, you're good. Cool. Um, because most people have now started to use balloons in their daily practice. Um, we have all three types or four balloon companies here. They're happy to give you balloons to practice in the lab. So please do that. You just need to walk up to the reps and ask them for their balloons. Um, and obviously you're gonna wanna do that before you do the rest of the surgeries and you destroy the sinuses. So, and I'll try to catch up some time here. Um, if we could, oh, there they are, great. I'm gonna talk about frontal sinus surgery today and really just some pearls, but before I do that, um, I was the course director at Summer Sinus Symposium with two of my closest friends, Doug Ray and Mark Dubin, for the last six and a half years. And that's over, we've passed the torch, and now I'm course director for this amazing course called Otolaryngology Underwater. It used to be chaired by David Kennedy and Bert O'Malley, and um, they tapped me and asked me to do it, and I said yes, as long as I could get CME support. And the Seattle Science Foundation here has been kind enough to not only run the logistics, but also, um, do the CME. So this will be at Half Moon Bay in Jamaica, October 24th through 27th of this year. I took one for the team and traveled down there uh, all last week and scoped out the resort. It's nice, it's really nice. So um, you can Google it and uh, register. Uh, it's really a fun course. It covers all aspects of ENT, so it's, it's everything. Every subspecialty, there's over 32 faculty members. Uh, hope you can make it. We'll do it again in 2025, so it bounces around the Caribbean every couple years. All right, with that, frontal sinus is hard. Uh, the surgery is hard, and, and I have a lot of referrals from uh, my nice community ENTs. Now that I'm in private practice, I was at the University of Washington for 12 years. The last three years I've been in private practice and, and enjoying it immensely. Um, but I still see a lot of referrals for frontal sinus disease, and it's because the anatomy changes on every single patient. It's uphill, and um, there's higher risks of injury, and Gravity wins, blood runs downhill. Don Lanza says this all the time, and it's true. You're looking uphill, the blood's gonna come down on you. And infl inflammation in a tight spot is bad, and it is the tightest part of our sinus anatomy. We're limited by the orbit and the skull base. Um, we're not limited by the septum or the anterior uh, frontal beak. So those are things that we can make bigger, but in general, we try to avoid those drill outs if possible. So here's a couple pearls, the mental checklist that I do on every single case. And the first thing I want you to do when we are done with the pro sections and we take a break and then you go to your labs is to scroll through your CT scan and learn your frontoethmoid anatomy. And this is not the former Kuhn type one, two, three, four. This is the newer and improved international consensus uh, guidelines of how we should approach the frontal sinus. And it comes down to the drainage pathway of the frontal sinus. Is it anterior to the bulla or not? That's the whole question. So here where we have a frontal recess, um, there's three different types of cells. You, and if the drainage is posterior to the frontal recess, you have three more cells, and then there's some cells in the middle. Let me explain. Exactly, so the auger cell is the first anterior ethmoid sinus that we know, and in a nice, easy, uh, frontal case, you take down that, or uh, what used to be called uncap the egg, that would open up your whole frontal sinus. But few people have that nice normal anatomy other than this patient here. Super auger cell is if there's a cell on top of the auger cell, okay? If that cell extends into the frontal sinus, that's called a super auger frontal cell. And this is important because you know you can't just uncap the egg. You're gonna have to uncap the egg and then uncap the egg above that. So you really have to get into the frontal sinus to get that top part. My pointer is challenging. You're gonna have to get this part out and that can be hard when you're just focused on getting into the frontal sinus there. Now, that is where the drainage is posterior to the auger system. Here is where we have the ethmoid bulla, super bolar cell, and just like before, a super bolar frontal cell. It's that simple. Um, and this shows a super orbital cell. Not too many people have this, but there is a higher chance of the anterior ethmoidal artery being in this area. And then finally, a frontal septal cell. 
more uncommon, uh, but this is where there's a cell right in the middle of the frontal sinus, and it's important to figure out beforehand, is that gonna drain into the right side or the left side? Because it's gonna have a separate passageway into the frontal sinus proper, and you really have to um, uh, rationalize that and take care of it. So we're gonna take this case, super auger frontal cell, drainage pathway behind it, Super bowler cell, drainage pathway in front of it. It's that easy. It's not going to be a surprise or a where's Waldo when you get to surgery. You're going to know exactly where it is before you get there. Here is the true mental checklist. And Arif has a big checklist, a wonderful checklist that he'll share with you if you ask him. It's great for residents. It's great to think of all those things. But these are the three things that I can only remember three things. So here they are. Anterior ethmoidal artery, don't hit it. Uh, laminate dehiscence, you always want to look for this. I'll talk about a litigation case regarding this uh, tomorrow. And you can see it here. It looks like ethmoid disease, kind of, but it's not. And then dehiscence. Anytime you have dehiscence, especially in a patient like this, where it's like Swiss cheese and there's dehiscence all over the place, you, know, you probably want to get an MRI with that. Uh, the shadowing of the CT scan, that tells you that your CT scan is kind of out of alignment and the tech should come in and fix it. All right, now moving on quickly, what instruments do we use? This is the instrument that I thought was everything I needed. Uh, a gently curved kerosene, a Cobra kerosene, a Hoseman frontal punch. Everybody have a Hoseman frontal punch? If you don't, buy at least two of them. They're the best instrument for the frontal sinus. I have uh, dramatically decreased the number of uh, Rad 60 blades that I use, the curved debrider blade, because I do almost all my frontal work now with a Hoseman. Um, it's great. It works better and preserves the mucosa. And then these are just three of the seven giraffes I have. Uh, it, you, know, you need the right instrument to do the right job, and I'll show you a couple uh, options. And <clears throat> the balloon, that's another instrument. So it's always nice to have a balloon. I don't use them very often. Um, and then the drill. There are very there are a lot of cases you get in there and the bone is just thick. You can't crack it with a J curette. I actually never use a J curette. Everyone else does, I just don't. Um, I use the, the curved kerosene to crack it and then grab it with the kerosene. But um, those times where the bone is really thick, you just thin it out with a drill and go about your day. Um, but the good thing is, if you're not used to using a drill in the sinuses, today is a great day to practice it. And just practice using it to take down some of those frontoethmoid bones. Um, I'll use mainly the 70 degree reverse taper, this one, if I know I'm not really by the skull base, or I use this bullet diamond burr here, those two. All right, here's a case, 40-year-old male, frontal sinus disease. I'll skip the rest, had medical therapy. And the sinus disease, it's not bad. You see a kind of mild inflammation there in the frontal recess. But he is miserable. Frontal pressure right here in the glabella area. Uh, didn't get better with steroids and antibiotics. So uh, that's that. And I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip it to the key points. And this here is the key point. That little partition. So here's our super auger frontal cell because it's going in. The drainage pathway is going to be right back there. And that's what we have to open up. So I know we have to get the bola down. I know I have to get this whole super auger and not just poke in, I have to get this whole thing. And this is where once you get a nice opening here, it's really nice to grab, put your hoseman in and just take everything anterior because you know that's super safe. And then the last piece is this vertical partition. And I'm going to come back to that. Okay. Um, going in, the easy part is finding the frontal recess. And there it is. So that's half the job. Once you find it, great. You find it with your navigation, and now it's a matter of making it bigger. This is where we're looking at on that CT scan. So we're going to go in and just confirm. And I like to use this 70 degree frontal ostium seeker on the Medtronic nav system. And I'm just palpating anterior, posterior, uh, medial, and lateral just to feel what's soft and what's not. And really, what I'm finding at this point is this section right here is where the pointer is. And all of this, everything in the middle, is going to have to go, which correlates to all of these little partitions in here. 
And this case is tough because you see these two skull base ethmoid cells. And those are the ones that aren't so fun to get that you kind of tighten up, but you just got to relax and you know you have to get those out. So I use this as a dissecting device as long as the bone isn't too thick. Uh, this is my favorite giraffe with the window in front so you can actually see what you're grabbing. And again, I've really changed from, and here I'm about ready to strip the mucosa, but then you just relax it and cut through it. And I've really changed from using powered instruments up here. This is just using a debrider to take care of the excess mucosa, but I don't use it to try to get the bone because it doesn't work that well. I like the RAD 60 3.5 millimeter uh, as opposed to the RAD 40. It gives you an easier angle to get up there. So now we're left with this last little partition. And that's kind of the hardest one. But here's this wonderful hoseman. I'm taking it anteriorly and also taking it posteriorly. The anterior ethmoid is quite a bit posterior from where we are right here. And now you start to see this, although it's dark up here, the kind of horizon view of where that skull base is making that beautiful curvature of where the brain is behind it. And you're just going to take it all the way down grabbing it again with uh, taking out these little bony partitions. And this is the monotonous part where you just have to take it a step at a time. Now, it's a lot easier when there's no bleeding, like in that case. How do you get to no bleeding? Um, TXA is something that I do routinely now. There's been a one of my friends at Stanford published a report recently that said TS, TXA didn't do anything. Um, I. Uh, I really question uh, some of the methodology and conclusions. Uh, it's, it works really well. And you give a gram of it, it, it costs, I thought it was going to be expensive. It's literally like five bucks. And you just do it in, the, in these no, nose patients, and it works nice. So I give it almost everybody TXA, unless it's a cancer case, uh, if there are any risk of blood clots. So oral contraceptive use, I won't do it. Any history of PEs. Um, I use topical epi, one to 1,000. We always mix the epi uh, and swirl it with a purple pen and draw it up with half by halves right away. You never, ever, ever want topical epi on the back table. That's clear, because that can, has been injected in uh, cases in the past. And I just use a giraffe and stick it up there and leave it. And while I'm doing that, I'll go to the other side and, and clean that up. So it's kind of just a little bit back and forth. But that's it. And that's going to take care of most of the bleeding. Um, I will use bipolar. I like the endoscopic bipolar with the two paddles, the pistol grip, rather than the bayonets, because I can't get the bayonets to open in the nose. Uh, there's so many absorbable hemostatic agents now, um, and I've taken the names off just to be complete, but there's a, a newer one um, that um, I think works really well that you might be able to see in the fishbowl. Um, these are all available, and they all have different positives and negatives. Some have chitosan, which helps decrease inflammation and is somewhat hemostatic as well. And then finally, every case, I open up a suction bovi, eight French uh, finger uh, button one. And I love the suction bovi. I'll, I'll spend a couple minutes at the end of every case um, gently cauterizing the oozing areas. And, and then if you're going to open up the frontal sinus, open it up. And that's a silly statement, but it's true. Don't just poke into it and like, all right, there it is, because that's going to stenose. If you're going to do it, do it completely, front to back, left to right. And then controlling the inflammation afterwards is really important. Um, I'm going to skip in the interest of time, but there's obviously stents available, uh, steroid eluting stents that you can use. Uh, there's uh, sponges uh, like the Vector that you can put up and inject steroids into it. So a lot of different things that can be done. So the summary to get us on track, know your anatomy, know your anatomy, know your anatomy. I'm going to walk around and ask you what your frontal sinus anatomy is, and I hope you have an answer for me. Okay, is it, a, is it an auger cell, super auger, super auger, auger frontal? And we can go over it. You know, this is, I'm not quizzing you. I, I joke about that, but I do want you to learn this new system. The UW and Madigan residents, I'm not joking. I'm going to ask you. Uh, the key to uh, frontal recess uh, dissection is do it thoroughly. Hemostasis makes it a lot easier. And then post-op topical steroids. Uh, there are companies now that are, one company in particular, that is a couple that are selling mometazone rather than pedestinide as a topical irrigation additive. Uh, there's a reason why Intersect ENT 
coated the Cyanuva and propels with mometazone. It's lipophilic. It sticks to the tissue much better than bedesonide. So I'm transitioning all my patients from bedesonide over to mometazone. It's not covered by insurance. Um, that's the downside. So if a patient does have bedesonide covered by insurance, I'll keep them on that. But something to ask the uh, pharmacies in the fishbowl today. And then finally, this is the absolute key. If we zoom in on it, you know, this surgeon was pretty confident they were in the frontal sinus. And in, imagine if you're looking up with a 30 degree scope, it's going to look like they did a nice frontal sinus surgery. But, you know, this vertical partition, that's the hard part. And that's what you got to get. So um, sometimes it's a hard through biting giraffe. Sometimes you have to put the drill up there and pull back towards yourself just to thin out that bone. So do practice with the drills today. That's um, how I do the frontal sinus surgery. We will show you all these different techniques in the lab. So at this point, you're welcome to stay here. You, it'll be piped in, or you can go to the lab and watch. You can also change into scrubs now, but there is.